you say, right? Yes. Good to be in church, right? Yes. Good to see me, right? Yes. Well, you guys just toned that down too much on that third one. I'm telling you, we have to work on you guys. Uh, I'll mention a couple of things about the book table. Did I tell you our guarantee? You know, you got to have a guarantee. And um, uh, I do want to tell you this. If you get, <clears throat> if you buy anything off of our book table and you are not 100% satisfied, tough. <laughs> <laughs> this ain't Walmart, bucko. Okay, my name's Sam, but it's not Walton. In, in fact, in fact, if you buy something off my table and you're not satisfied, take it back to Walmart. <laughs> they will take anything back. In fact, when we get a little low on cash, I take some of my books back to Walmart. They don't even know. They just give me the money. But um, uh, anyway, uh, yeah, my wife will be back there to help you. This, this is called Valiant for the Truth. It's, a, it's aimed at homeschooling, but uh, several Christian schools use it. Bible institutes use it. Uh, sometimes just an individual, an adult who didn't get a chance to learn something about the King James Bible, they get it. Um, guys, I'm in a King James Bible church every time I preach. Yeah. And, um, and I come into a King James Bible church, I hear this all the time. I can't, it, it, it just drives me crazy. Uh, it'd be, a, it's either a parent, brokenhearted parent, or a brokenhearted pastor. Uh, they'll say, we sent our daughter, son, whatever, to a, to a, quote, unquote, King James Bible Believing Bible College. Uh, and as soon as they got there, they heard the King James homosexual, Easter's mistranslation, uh, the italics need to be taken out. Uh, and they came back, and here's what they'll say. They came back and broke fellowship with our church. Now they call us heretics and go somewhere else. Yeah. So I say, why should we have to re-evangelize our own children? Yeah. Why don't we inoculate them before they go? So that blue border is called Series 11. It's aimed at the 11th grade. The red border is... Uh, uh, as is aimed at grade 12. Uh, they're very similar to AC format, uh, 12 lessons uh, per uh, year, uh, and they work. I've, uh, lately, we've been getting a ton of testimonies from young people. Uh, I was in California a while back, and the pastor's daughter in a King James Bible in Bible College, um, she laughed. She said, she took these. She said, um, my professor even attacked the King James Bible with the very questions you said he would in here. So see, I'm a prophet. Um, I had this one testimony uh, years ago. There was this young, young guy. Uh, literally, I preached to him all of his life. And um, uh, I mean, I was there when he was born and preached all through it. And then when he got into 11th and 12th grade, he took these. <clears throat> and he got, um, he got an appointment to the Air Force Academy. Uh, and about two weeks in, he called his mom and he said, Mom, he said, I just uh, spent you know, three or four days bivouacked out with, uh, in, in, with 14 other guys in a tent. And they got talking about the Bible. Now, do you know what 14 lost men said about the Bible? They said this. If God really wrote the Bible, there'd only be one of them and not so many. See, lost man's got good sense. You've got to be saved to be stupid. I didn't say you got to be stupid to be saved, but you got to be saved to go, well, I think, you know, if you, if you like the NI, sometimes I read the NIV and sometimes I read the ESV and sometimes I read the New King James. You're sick. All right. And a lost man's got better sense than that. Uh, in fact, that is one of the charges that the Muslims bring against Christianity. There's so many Bibles. But uh, he said, he said that we got talking about the Bible. And he said, for the next two hours and 45 minutes, I taught them what I learned in these lessons. So uh, they are back there. They, uh, they will help. They will help. Uh, this one is actually the first book I wrote. Uh, this is the third edition. Uh, it's called An Understandable History of the Bible. It is. It really is an understandable history of the Bible. Starts from no Bible whatsoever to the Bible that you're holding in your hand. Uh, there is a section in here uh, on King James proving he was not homosexual. I don't care what you were told or what you want to believe. Uh, there's a section with something on every one of the King James translators. Uh, a comparison of the King James Bible and the mistakes that are in uh, modern versions. This one, uh, this third edition has a chapter. It took me seven years to write. Um, uh, about, uh, 23 years ago, yeah, 23 years ago, I did a, a kind of a national uh, debate on television, uh, where we debated the, um, uh, head of the new international version, head of the, uh, new King James, a guy working on new American standard, uh, and then two other, uh, anti Bible guys. And as one guy's, uh, a guy named is Dan Wallace. He, he's, uh, I think he's retired now, but he's, he's probably one of the world's leading, uh, textual critics, uh, and, he, and he held up a chart uh, of Bible witness uh, or of manuscript witnesses to Bibles. 
And this is what I do. And I'm looking and I'm saying, I'm thinking the manuscript number for the bad Bibles is correct. But the manuscript number for the King James is way lower than it should be. And I knew what was going on. I just did not approve it. It's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like embezzling. You can't accuse anybody till you find out who did it, how they did it and where the money went. And that started a seven year, uh, a seven year search. So there's a, there's a chapter in here called the great Bible heist. And, and you know, today you don't have to, you don't have to go into a bank with a gun to rob a bank. You can sit in your room with a computer and just move money electronically from here to here. And that's what they've done. They've not done a thing to the manuscripts. They've just invented two other classes of manuscripts so that they, they could take the manuscripts out of the King James column. Uh, how about, uh, I'll give you an example. How about this? If I can find it here. What if, um, uh, what if you had, um, uh, What if you had $271 in a bank account? You'd have somebody else's bank account, I know. Oh, no, I'm sorry, 243. I, I got to tell you, this happened one time. Uh, when we were living in Ohio, my bank called me, and they said, Mr. Gipp, we've made a mistake with your bank, with your bank account. I said, what is it? They said, we, we deposited $5,000 of someone else's money in your account. I said, thank you. <laughs> I said, my last bank only gave me a toaster. <laughs> but what if, um, what if you had um, $243 in a bank account and you went to draw it a hundred and they said, you can't because you don't have enough money. Sure, I got $243. Say, no, you only got 71. You know, somebody stole your money. That's the number of unsealed witnesses, 243 that back your King James Bible and with the new system of, of juggling the numbers, it's 71. So, so that is, uh, that is a, uh, it is an understandable history. The preacher told you about that lady. Uh, she was a Roman Catholic, about 85 years old, got saved. Uh, they gave her that book. She promptly broke a hip trying to pick it up. But um, anyway, um, that may be a help to you. Uh, this, this, I didn't write this. We published this. It's called Thy Kingdom Come. This is volume one. There's a volume two. And uh, you know what historical novels are? where they tell you the history, but they, they, they kind of have it in a story. And that's what this is kind of like about the Bible. I'll tell you where we've gotten comments on this. Parents have teenagers that don't want to read. And they get this and they start reading. They enjoy reading and they learn something about their Bible. So those are back there. Uh, this, and I will, ex I will explain this, guys. <clears throat> I am not a Calvinist. But I was predestinated from the foundation world not to be one. So it's really not my fault. I tried being a Calvinist once, but, but not being one was irresistible. Uh, and again, about, uh, well, this is back in, uh, oh man, I think uh, 09, I think 09, uh, we, we debated some Calvinists uh, and um, it was like, uh, and, they, and believe it or not, the Calvinists were King James Bible believers. They're just messed up on Calvinism. And then there were the King James Bible believers that were not messed up on Calvinism. And uh, we debated these Calvinists and we won, but it was predestined. But anyway, um, this is, uh, this is two DVDs, uh, two hours per DVD. So it's four hours on Calvinism. Now, let me explain some the reason we did this. And, and it actually was after I did this, that, that this kind of, uh, opened up to me, um, the contemporary movement, it is being infested yes. with Calvinism. Yeah. I mean, Calvinism sweeping through the contemporaries, like, like fire through dry grass, and I wondered about that, but then I, I figured this out. And really, this is what it is. Even a nominal Christian wants to know some Bible. And Calvinism is what I call lazy man's theology. If you can spell tulip, you think you know the mind of God. And so, uh, and if you study church history, uh, when you start, uh, you know, from Jerusalem coming across through Europe, you'll find that as, as a nation spiritually died, Calvinism increased, which is exactly what is happening in this country right now. So uh, Calvinism is sweeping through the contemporaries. That may, that may help uh, arm you on, uh, on what is wrong with it, okay? Uh, and there's some other things back there. Just throw your wallet down there. We'll give you something. Um, open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6.
And it starts, uh, we'll start reading about verse 10. This is, a, this is a familiar passage to you, I'm sure. It's a good passage. Of course, it's all good, you know. Uh, it says, finding my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers uh, of the darkness of this age, against the news media, against... Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sometimes I tend toward a modern translation. Anyway, uh, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's kind of like the same thing. Uh, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able, uh, be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith. Wherewith you are able to, to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Uh, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto uh, with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Let's bow our heads. Let's talk to the author of these words. Father, it is good to be saved. God, uh, I am impressed with you. You know, God, it is so funny. I, I, not, not, not humorous funny. It's amazing funny. That here I am, I'm nothing but a walking piece of dirt. And yet when I address my creator, I say, Father. And the only reason I can do that is because you did that. You made that to happen. And Lord God, here we are. All we are is just some walking, talking dirt balls. And you know our wicked hearts. And you know uh, everything about us. That you would, Lord, you could have saved us and not made us your sons. We'd still go to heaven. But you made us our, your sons on top of everything else. And we thank you, God, for that. Now, Lord, this is Tuesday night, not a church night. These folks have honored you by coming because they want to hear something from your book. So, God, please, I asked before, get Sam Gip out of their way, out of your way, and accomplish your purpose, God, in the life of each person represented here. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. amen. Now, you don't have to say amen. I'm not going to ask you to say amen to the statement. Uh, but you will know that, that I am correct. Uh, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm not trying to embarrass you. Uh, you don't have to, uh, to say amen. But probably every one of you at one time or another, you have been in some situation where, where you were the one that needed to take a stand for the Lord. You know, uh, I, I, I'm a preacher. Uh, and sometimes I wonder about preachers. You know, they get themselves into trouble. Then they send letters all over the country saying, oh, who will come and join us? And, and we'll link arms and we'll take a united stand. I never seen Baptists take a united stand about anything except fried chicken. And, um, but guys, when you're at work, you are the only person on the, on the job. You're the only Christian there. Is that not true? And, and you knew I am the one that has got to take a stand for God here. And you didn't. You didn't. You, you just failed the Lord. I'm not, I'm not accusing you, brother. I, my hand is up on that, all right? Uh, but you say this, you say, yeah, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of like, uh, like the cowardly lion. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm not going to be afraid. I'm going to be afraid. <laughs> and you say, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, uh, 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 you know, I'm not going to be quiet. Next time I'm going to take a stand. And then the situation happens again and you just fold up. And you say, well, I read here, it says I'm supposed to be willing to take a stand. Well, yes, you did. But let me ask you a question. In this book of Ephesians, where we read about taking a stand, what chapter is it in? Six, which is what? The last one. You know, a lot of people start at the back instead of starting at the beginning. And so I'm going to talk to you tonight about why, if you, have a if you have trouble taking a stand, there may be something. If you are having trouble uh, fulfilling Ephesians chapter 6 in your life, it may be for this reason. You haven't fulfilled chapter 5. Okay? I mean, that's how it goes. You say, well, what's the thing about chapter 5? Well, look at verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another uh, in the fear of God. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Ladies, ladies. I, I didn't write the Bible. I didn't say that, okay? God wrote the Bible. I didn't put that in there. I, isn't it funny you read that verse and then a woman will come and get in your face like I put it in there? I didn't write the Bible. I didn't put that in there. Had I written the Bible, I, I would have put something a lot like that in there. 
I mean, it probably would have said something about a cup of coffee, chocolate chip cookies, my slippers and the paper, but um, <laughs> it says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as Christ, uh, as the church is, in sub is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Then if I'm talking to a wife, then here may be your problem. If I'm talking to the husband, here may be your problem. Lady, your problem may be that you're not submitting to your husband. Now, nobody wants to talk about that, that anymore. You know, I was telling the pastor, either it was today or yesterday, and, and this is the truth, guys. You know what's wrong with our country right now? It is being run by a bunch of overbearing women and effeminate men. Now, lady, don't come up after church and get in my face about that because I'll know. <laughs> tell that worm of a husband to get up here and tell me and I'll know. Okay. But the fact is, that's what it is. I mean, everybody's a Hillary. You know, everybody is some, some uh, woman that just gets in your face. But I just don't like that. And they all think that you have to change for them. And then you get some man. You know, let me, let me explain how this works. Here's dad. Here's mom. Here's their kid. He's playing football. Here's what the old man says. Son, go in there and hit him hard. Make him cry. And then mom says, now, honey, you, you don't hit him too hard because if you hurt somebody, then you're going to feel bad. Now, you want to know which parent is right? Both of them. <laughs> oh, really? Both of them are right. That is the way a father should be. And you don't want a mother to be like a father. That's a woman needs compassion. She, she needs a lot of compassion. You know why? Because we don't have any. <laughs> and I'm not even in the market for it, okay? I'm not trying to get any. But, um, uh, but, but see, here's the thing. The dad says go in there and hit the kid hard. Mom says don't hit him too hard. That's not a problem. Then the kid goes into the play to play the ball, the game, and the, the mother, the wife looks at the husband and says, now you shouldn't tell him that because he's going to hurt somebody someday. Then you're going to feel bad. And he goes, yeah, honey, you're right. I'm sorry. And that's when he just became effeminate. Yeah, yeah. That's when he just surrendered his masculinity. Wow. Uh, I was preaching in a church, you know, and I said something. I got a bumper sticker back there. Oh, I said something about, remember the other day I said something about people from Kentucky. Excuse me, brother, nothing personal. <laughs> uh, and I got a bumper sticker that says uh, public education is child abuse. You say, well, why do you have a bumper sticker that says it? Because it is. Yeah. I'm sorry, it is. I didn't say public school teachers are child abusers. I said that the system is, is child abuse. I told you when, you, when you bring lesbians and homosexuals to talk to five and six-year-olds and tell them you might be one of these, you ought to give it a try. When you tell them they don't, they're not even allowed to know what sex they are, that is child abuse. Well, I said that. I just said that in passing in the, love, uh, the, the love, lovely way I said it. Uh, and after the morning service, this woman's walking by and I said, how you do? She goes, well, not bad for a child, child molesting hillbilly. And I said, why? She says, I'm from Kentucky. I didn't know they let her out. Anyway, um, <laughs> and she says, and I'm a public school teacher. Now, listen, if you're a public school teacher, I am not accusing you of child abuse. But that system is child abuse. Yes, when I was in school, the education part of, edu of, of the public school system was being deleted. They went to new math, which nobody could learn so that we would not know math. Then they destroyed history. Then they destroyed the sciences. Now those are long gone. Now they're nothing but social engineering. Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, and so this woman says, you know, I'm from Kentucky. And, I'm a, and here's what you could tell. This woman was used to having men apologize to her. She probably, you remember, you know, in World War II, them bomb runs they'd have and they'd put another mark on the side of the fuselage of the plane. We, we had another bomb run. Somewhere she had a mark with a bunch of men. Made him bow, made him say sorry, got that guy. And, uh, and so she started, you know, she started with her little thing, you know, waiting for me to apologize. And I said, well, ma'am, I said, if you're a public school teacher, you got to know better than anybody in this church that that system is child abuse. And so that didn't work. So she tried something else. Uh, and, and I knew where this was going, okay? Uh, and it got to the, the, the woman's last resort. She started crying. I was really brokenhearted. And, um, but I told her, I, and I wasn't abusive to her. I said, ma'am, I said, I don't want to make you cry, but I said, you can cry all day long. I am not apologized for what I said because it was not in error. Yes, sir. Amen. Oh man, I am telling you what, I mean, she called the pastor that afternoon. He almost canceled the meeting. 
Then he kept it going, and she left six months later. She grabbed the worm of a husband she had by the ear and drug him out of there, okay? And, and, and that is an overbearing woman. And this, na- this nation is run by a bunch of overbearing women. Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, I was, I was telling your pastor, we get these men come back from combat, and, and they've killed people. And a woman says, don't you feel bad about it? And you know what he feels bad about? That he doesn't feel bad about it. You know what that, 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 what that classic answer, they ask the Marine, when you shoot somebody, what do you feel? Recoil. <laughs> but see, he says, the guy, no, you know what he's doing? He's doing what a man has to do. Guy, ladies, ladies, you don't want us to be like you because someone has to go kill people. Yeah. That's why we're free. That's what men do. So then a man comes back and he's, he, he kills people because, in, because he has to, uh, and then somebody says, and he doesn't feel bad about it. Well, we'll make him feel bad about it. Let him alone. Quit turning him into a woman. All right? And so that book says that a woman has to submit to her husband. Maybe you're having a problem with that. Lady, maybe, maybe you have a problem with it. Now I know what you're going to say. And I think you might be right. You might say, well, you have to understand. My husband is the one that took all of our life savings and put it in Enron. And what we did salvage, uh, you know, we, uh, we, we put in this solar panel company that Obama told us about. <laughs> you know what? That's a very tough thing because she's still got to submit to him. Here's what women say. Women say, I, he, I'm supposed to submit, but if I could just understand what he's thinking, then I could submit. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You know why? Because women and men don't think alike. Hallelujah. Oh, I just got my heart lightened there. But that's the truth. Well, wait a second. You know what? Aren't we the bride of Christ? And you know what I hear Christians say? God told me to do something and I'm just not going to do it. I hear people say this all the time. They go, well, when God tells me to do something, when God tells me to jump, I just say how high and where to, which is exactly why you're never going to do anything for God. Because you're going to wait until God is reasonable, explains how high you're supposed to jump and where to you're supposed to jump. You say, well, if I don't know how high and where to, well, how about this? If you're jumping for God, how high? How about as high as you possibly can? Well, where to? How about straight up? If he wants you to land someplace different, he can spin the globe under you while you're in the air. Is that not true? But we're all sitting around. And here's what people, men say this. Well, you know, if God would just explain to me why he's doing this. Yeah, that's exactly what your wife says about you, pal. And you know why God is never going to explain it to you? Because we humans and God don't think alike. And so lady, maybe you're having a problem with submission. It is difficult. I will admit it is difficult, but that's what you're going to have to do. Maybe lady, the reason you can't take a stand in Ephesians chapter six is because in Ephesians chapter five, you're not submitting yourself to your husband. Now, men, look what it says about verse 25. Husbands love your wives. Do you know why women are told to submit to their husbands? I I have heard this. I've heard people say, well, women have a problem with submission, and that's why they're told that. That's half true. Men have a problem with submission too. The difference is this. In a man's life, there's basically two places he really has to submit. If he goes to the military, he has to submit. And if he gets a job, he has to submit. But if you go to the military and you get tired of submitting, don't re-enlist. Right? And if you got a job, you know what? We have three sons. And I used to pray. I think this, all young men, when they get out of the house, at least their first or second job, they should work for a mouth-breathing idiot. They should work with a guy. I I said, son, when you go out to get a job, see if the guy's got four holes inside of his face. He's been trying to eat with a fork again. Work for him. You say, why is that? Oh, come on, guys. Haven't you ever worked for an idiot? I mean, I, I worked for this guy one time. He's an idiot. And um, uh, I was running some wire. We, were, we, we did remodeling and insulation and, and all this stuff. Uh, and we were running a security system. You are looking at the guy that read the instructions. Men don't read instructions. I did because I'd never done this before. And you got to run, you gotta run uh, two separate lines. And my boss said, no, you don't. Run one. Every window, every door has to be its own circuit. You have to go to that window and back and then to that window and back and all the way to that window and back. You don't run it in one big series. <clears throat> and, um, and he said, run single wire. I said, I said, no, no, you got to run 
two strand. He goes, run single. I said, yes, sir, you stupid idiot. <laughs> anyway, um, and so I did. I got done. He energized the system. It didn't work. Then he picked up the instructions and he said, you're supposed to run two wire. Thoughts that go through your head are not always legal. I said, okay, I'll do it. And he couldn't understand why I was done an hour later. It took him a whole day to run this wire. And I'm done an hour later. You know why? Because I knew he's an idiot. And I knew it wasn't going to work. So I ran, I ran Siamese wire, one line, one, one side uh, black coating, the other side white coating. I, I leaned it all hooked up to the black. When it didn't work, all I'd do is just change some wire nuts, flip this one white, black, white, black, white, black. Whole thing worked. He said, how'd you do that? So I'm pretty smart. <laughs> But he's an idiot, okay? He's an idiot. But a man, if he doesn't like being in the military, if he doesn't like submitting there, or if he doesn't like uh, submitting at work, you get another job. But a woman has to submit to this guy all her life. But then it says this, men, husbands, love your wives. Now, I want to say this. Ladies, don't, don't, don't shut me down on what I'm about to say. Let me finish my statement, okay? Women say some stupid things. Oh, they do. They do. Remember, lady, the dumbest thing you ever said? I do. Anyway, um, <laughs> but women do. They, they say some stupid things. Now, wait a minute, lady. Wait a minute. Men also say stupid things. And I don't believe this. I don't believe that women say things that are more stupid than men. I don't think men say things that are more stupid than women. It's just a different class of stupid, okay? When a woman says something stupid... It's so obvious, everybody just gets a chuckle. I mean, you know, so a woman will say something, and I'm like, do you, do you really, oh, you go, oh, I can't believe, I, I can't very excited. Everybody has a laugh. When a man says something stupid, he thinks it ought to be etched in granite and memorized by children. <clears throat> he thinks it is oracle. Only, a, listen, a woman says something stupid, but when a man says something stupid, only a man can say it and finish with this. Huh? And you know, when, when preachers have to, have to counsel a, a married couple that's having problems, probably nine times, I wouldn't say nine times, about seven times out of 10, the woman will say, he never says he loves me. And here's Mr. Stupid. Well, I told you I loved you 25 years ago when we got married. I mean, if it changes, I'll let you know. <laughs> huh? You know what that is? That's stupid, okay? Now, here's what I think her response to that should be. Well, I made breakfast for you 25 years ago when we got married. Uh, if I feel like doing it again, I'll let you know. <clears throat> hey, guys, guys, you know what you need to do? You need to love your wives. Uh, I highly resent men who, and I'm going to use this horrible word now, but that's what it is, date. Now, dating is not running from motel room to motel room, but um, uh, you take your, your hope-to-be wife out for dinner, and you open a door for her, and you buy a meal for her, and you buy flowers for her, and you tell her she's beautiful, uh, and then you change her last name, name to yours, and you never do it again. Yeah. Was your whole dating time one big lie? You are trying to convince this woman that if we get married, this is what marriage life will be like. But once you got married, you never did it again. You sorry thing. Yeah. I still like taking my wife out. I really do. I, I love taking my wife out to eat. Just sit there and watch her eat. <laughs> honey, honey, may, may, maybe you could use silverware. Yeah, I, I know, but it's spaghetti. <laughs> well, could you just use one hand? But um, I was telling them last night, man, I used to run off with my wife. I tell my preacher friends, it's okay to run off with your own wife. Yeah. Yeah. Some of these guys got the right idea. They just got the wrong candidate, you know. But um, hey, I still take my wife out. Uh, I buy her flowers. It makes me so mad when I buy her flowers. I'll be in the line to buy flowers and I'll get this. The, the, the lady work could run the cashier, so... Somebody's in trouble. <laughs> Is that the only time men buy flowers? And I, I, tell, I take them home. I said, babe, we're, we're celebrating today. One time I was buying flowers. This woman said, what did you do? 
I said, lady, I married the greatest woman in the world and she, did, she deserves far more than these flowers. That's all she's going to get. But anyway, she deserves far more than those flowers. Hey, you know what you ought to do? You ought to call your wife names. Yeah, you ought to call her beautiful. You ought to tell her hair looks nice. Now, lady, you have to do something, okay? All right. I mean, today, you know, you know, there was a day when women wanted their hair to look nice. Now there's two prevalent hairdos for women. One is, I call it the potato chip clip. And that's where the lady gathers it all up. Goes over the potato chip bag, takes that clip off and snaps that baby on there and she's done for the night. And, and I got to tell you the truth. I'm in a meeting one time and we sat behind this woman and every night she had the same hairdo, but every night she had a different color potato chip clip. I thought, <laughs> what a trendsetter. Oh man. I can see the back of her head on some, some woman's magazine, you know, how, how to really set a trend. Uh, and then the other, the other hairdo is what I call stick your head out of the car window away to church and then spray it in place. <laughs> and that's, that's in 10 mile an hour increments. I mean, like it's 50 miles an hour, 60 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour. <laughs> but here's the thing. You say, well, what would you men do if some man walked up to your wife with you standing there and said, well, you look beautiful today. You'd say, wait a minute, pal, that's my wife. You don't tell her she's beautiful. I'm going to tell you men something. She needs to hear it from somebody. And if you don't say it, some other man will. You know what you get? Listen, it, it, four books in the, in the middle of the Bible. You need to read the whole book, but the four books in the middle of the Bible, they're so, they're, they're so needed. The book of Psalms. The book of Psalms speaks to your spirit. Have you never gone to Psalms when you're sick, sad, scared, d- distraught, right? So you go to Psalms and you read it, and, and, and you, it, it speaks to your spirit. The next one, Proverbs, speaks to your soul. You know, I tell people that you ought to read a proverb a day and 10 pages of your Bible every day. I never read a proverb that I don't find something else lacking in my personality, which is why I can only take one a day. And then after that is Ecclesiastes. Do you know what Ecclesiastes is? That is a man's cold, hard way of looking at life. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. I mean, the family comes into church on Sunday. They're all excited. What are you excited about? We got a new car. It's got power locks. It's got power windows. It's got heated seats. And and dad says, yeah, wait till they break. I got to pay to fix them, you know. I mean, that's how a man is. You know who needs to read that? Women. About the best time you women should read that is right after you just spent two hours looking at your wish book. (coughs) Finding one more worthless piece of something, whatever it is that you're going to buy and put in your living room. You know, you know, there was a day when women decorated their houses for their families and now they decorate it for other women. Yeah. Now they do something in the living room and say, Oh, you've got to come over and see what I did. And you won't even let him touch it. I hear women say, Oh my, all he does is sit on the couch and hold the remote and watch football. That's because that's all he's allowed to touch. <laughs> you have taken this wild beast and you've put him in a museum And if you don't want him to touch the remote, paint it mauve. Trust me, he will never touch it again. (laughs) But you do. You see some picture in a magazine and you try to outdo the woman across the street. You don't care about your husband. I was in this house one time and off in the corners, a bunch of uh, gift boxes, bows, ribbons, nice paper. I said, oh, I said, somebody's having a birthday. Woman said, no. Somebody's anniversary. No. I said, what's in the boxes? She said, nothing. <laughs> I used to get that every Christmas. Anyway, um, <laughs> it must shop the same place my parents did. Anyway, um, she said, she said um, those are just for looks. One time I walked in the house, and honest, this woman said, she, she pointed it, she said, that's our living room. We don't go in there. <laughs> she had placed it. Everything was Velcroed to the table so that it was all in the right place and it looked the right way. Lady, lady. Now, you need to read Ecclesiastes because after you saw all that junk that you think you need, you might just say, I'm not going to get it. It's all vanity. But then men, right after Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon, you know what it is? Mush. Now, it is inspired mush. It is God-given mush. Gentlemen, eat your mush. (laughs) Do what the Song of Solomon does, teaches you how to talk to a woman. He says, oh, my love, my dove, my undefiled, dries like the fish pools of Heshbon. 
Your teeth are like the sheep that just come up from the watering and everyone's, everyone's uh, 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 twins uh, and none are barren. You know what he just said? She's got a full mouth of teeth. Yeah, none are barren. Everyone's, you know the joke, what do you got if you got 32 Iraqi women in one room? A full set of teeth. But um, <laughs> you know what you men need to do? You need to look at Song of Solomon so you learn how to, you're allowed to compliment your wife. If you love your wife, you ought to tell her. I tell my wife, I do not know how many times I've told that lady today that I love her. And I'll guarantee I'll tell her a few more times before the the night is over. You say, why? Because I love her. I tell her she's beautiful. You say, why? Because she's beautiful. And so you ought to say that. And if you read the Song of Solomon, you'd find out how you're allowed to talk to your wife. Now, forewarned, don't say she has a nose like the Tower of Lebanon. (laughs) She'll kill you while you were sleeping, bucko. Or she'll get a new mushroom recipe, one or the other. But, but you know what you men, you, maybe you men are not telling your wife you love her. Maybe you're not taking her out. I like to take my wife out. I really do. We just, I mean, I don't care if it's a junk food burger. Uh, you know, we'll leave here Thursday, drive 550 miles Thursday, start a meeting Friday. Uh, and and uh, we're going to get a donut. We love to get a donut and a cup of coffee when we take off. Uh, and then we'll stop for junk food burger because uh, that's vitamin J, I told you. And... Um, and we like it, but I just enjoy being in the truck with her. And I'll sometime during the day, I'll look over and say, I'm just glad you're here. Why don't you tell your wife you're glad she's there? Why don't you tell her she looks good? Now, lady, try to look good. <laughs> but what I'm telling you people is maybe you can't take a stand. You know what happens to a good soldier when he gets a Dear John letter? You can have one of the most efficient soldiers there is, and he's just about to go out on patrol, and he opens up the mail and finds out that his wife took off with somebody else and said, I'm divorcing you. And now he can't take that stand. He's not good. Maybe you're having trouble with Ephesians chapter 6 taking a stand for God because your marriage, Ephesians chapter 5. You haven't taken care of chapter 5. How are you going to take care of chapter 6? But maybe you haven't taken care of chapter chapter 5 because you haven't taken care of chapter 4. Chapter 4 tells us about our, our relationships, listen to this, with God. You need to have your relationship with God to be right. Now look at chapter 4, look at verse 12. I will look at verse 11. For he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. All right. Did you just notice that my ministry as an evangelist is in the same verse with the pastors that are here? What is it for? For the perfecting of the saints. Yes, sir. Now, guys, I am not against soul winning. and I'm not against people getting saved in church. But do you understand that God put this church here for, for the saved people right. to be perfected? And if a pastor is not in his Bible, he can't perfect the saints because he doesn't know any Bible. So you know what he does? He, well, I, I don't want to say it, but just like, guys, don't we have a complaint? I'll bet you have a complaint that everybody, every, every welfare mother in this state knows how to have children, but she doesn't know how to raise them. Yeah. And we have churches that they can, I've heard guys say, well, my church is a spiritual maternity ward. Yeah, it's full of babies. And it's, we, 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 were, we were someplace, I don't know where, as one of the three boys were with us. And, and we went to this church. We had an open Sunday. We went to this church. And I don't tell people I'm going to ban this or anything like that. I tell my wife to tell them. But, um, but look, really, really. I mean, if you had a man and his wife and three kids and they all come in, suits, ties, worn out Bibles and say amen and know the hymns, wouldn't you figure they're probably saved? Yes, sir. Okay, so he preached Sunday morning on salvation. Well, okay, because that's, you know, salvation Sunday or he's trying to get people in the morning and that's when you bring the visitors. And sometimes Sunday morning is the evangelical and Sunday night's more for the church. And the guy got done after Sunday school on how to win people to Christ, Sunday morning about the need to be saved. He said, now come back tonight. I'm going to be teaching on the necessity for salvation. We went somewhere else. You say, why? I don't mean it's bad. We don't need that one. I don't need to know about salvation. I'm saved. You understand? I don't need to learn anything more about how to do it. I want to go as a saint. And I want to go to a church and find out what's wrong with me so I can make it right for God. So what are we here for? For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come in uni- in the unity of the faith. of the faith. Guys, guys, if, if we're going to be here till we're united, the Lord is never coming back. Until we uh, come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children, tossy, you go to church and you grow. 
We no more be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait uh, to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Watch this. From whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of every measure, uh, uh, the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So what did he just say? He said the whole body is supposed to work. You go to church, you know what you find out? You find out what you got to change to make God happy. You know, I, I led a good, a good friend of mine after I got saved. Uh, he was a high school friend. Uh, he had hair down over his shoulders and I led him to Christ. I didn't tell him to get his hair cut. I told him to read his Bible. And you know, I could tell when he's reading his Bible because he came to me one day and he said, well, you know, I think uh, if God wants me to cut my hair, he'll make me want to. I thought, well, I wonder, wonder why that stood out. I think I might've known he'd been in first Corinthians a little bit. But he said this, he said, if God wants me to cut my hair, I think he'll make me want to cut my hair. I said, no, no. I said, if God wants you to cut your hair, he'll tell you to cut your hair. I said, if he makes you want to cut your hair, then you're cutting it because you want to. But if you don't want to cut it and you know he wants you to, then you're doing it for him. I'm going to tell you people something. I don't know the, I don't know the answer to this question. I am not seeking the answer to this question. Maybe I still like the taste of beer. I said, maybe. You say, why? I hadn't tasted it in 48 years. Gave it up. Got saved. Quit. But I didn't quit because I didn't like the taste anymore. Do you understand? I quit because as a Christian, that was no testimony to have for God. Amen. You say, well, where'd you get that from? Go to church. Amen. I got edified. Yeah. I found out there was something wrong with me. And you know what? I am I'm part of the body of Christ. Now, you know what your complaint is? Who doesn't complain about a part of the body that does not work? Called a pastor. A pastor called me the other day. Uh, I got a meeting with him uh, a year from now up in Pennsylvania and, uh, and he said he's walking with a walker and he said his ankles are bad and his ankles are so bad that the two, the two um, remedies the doctor said is we'll cut both your feet off. Really cut them off above the ankle or we'll real, we'll, we will rebuild your feet. You will lay in bed for six months and then you'll, you'll recuperate for another year and a half. But in talking, no one, and he says, and I still feel good. He said, I feel great. He says, just my ankles don't work right. And he went, stupid ankles. Yeah. You ever say that? You ever go to pick something up? You're back. Oh, you stupid back. Man, I can't tell you how many times I've said stupid neck. You know what? We are part of the body of Christ. You know what? Whatever part I am, you know what I hope God doesn't say? Stupid gip. Just when, hey, just when you needed your back to work, just when you needed your legs to straighten out, just when you needed your knees to lock, they didn't work. And you said, stupid knees. And just when we need to take a stand for God, just when we need to plant our feet, lock our knee, knees, straighten our back up and say, I'm standing here for God. And God says, stupid knee. And then it says, when the body, when the body, everything works, then the body reproduces itself. Guys, maybe you don't understand your new relationship with God. We are supposed to be doing something for him. Yes. We are supposed to be getting edified for him. Oh, wait a minute. You're not being able to fulfill chapter six standing for him because your marriage may not be right in chapter five, but your marriage is not going to be right. How can you have your relationship with your husband or your wife be right if your relationship with your God is not right? Yeah. And so that is chapter four, but there's a chapter that comes before that chapter three. Maybe your problem is you don't understand your Bible. My goodness, people, if, if the Bible and everything in, in this, in this earth, in this ministry was all about salvation, the Lord would not have inspired anything more than God's simple plan of salvation track. Isn't that true? Can't you give somebody the simple plan of salvation track and they read it and get saved? Then why do you write any more? I mean, if that's all he's interested in, but that's not all he's interested in, is it? There's more to this. You know, when I lead somebody to Christ, isn't this true? You could, you could, if someone is receptive, you could lead somebody to Christ with 10 or 12 verses. Isn't that true? Yeah. And when I do that, you know what I'll do? I'll get done. I'll say, now, look, I said, uh, you know, you just got saved, right? Yep. And I'll say, now, look, I showed you about 10 verses. Yep. I said, so, uh, I said, what do you think is in the rest of this book for you now? 
I mean, think about that, guys. If you can get saved with about 10 verses, a dozen verses, I don't care if you want to say 20, 24 verses. Guys, there's a whole book here. Let me tell you what we've, we've ceased to do. We've ceased to become students of this book. Yes, we are not students of this book. Uh, I want to say a word, and you're going to misunderstand it. I am a scholar. Oh, you think you're an expert. I didn't say I'm an expert. I said I'm a scholar. You should be too. Yes, you see, you know what a scholar is? A student. They're not a college professor. They're not somebody that wrote a book on a subject. You know what they used to say in the 1800s? These little kids come skipping, you know, with their, with their, their books all on a belt, and they're skipping into church. And you know what the teachers used to stand there? They'd see their students coming. they go, here come the little scholars. Because that's what a scholar is. Guys, you should never quit learning that book. Yes. And, and how are you going to get this book down when you're a piece of clay? And it was written by an infinite God. You know, I had a guy complaining. Told you they say something stupid. Uh, and he says, well, I just don't understand God. And I said, I said, now tell me if this isn't true. Come on, guys. I said, you had your parents figured out by the time you were 12. And you want a God you can understand? Come on, you, met, you guys, you guys. You know what no guy here ever did? When you were 12 years old, you never said on a school day morning, you never said to your dad, you know, I, I don't feel very good. My stomach, I think I'm sick. You never said that to your dad. What would your dad say? Go to school, boy. We'll pick up your body on the way home. <laughs> you said that to your mother. Well, honey, you just stay home. And, 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 and maybe you stay home and you'll feel better. Yeah, I think I will, mom. Just maybe some cookies and milk. <laughs> Did you ever say this, guys? Did you ever, at 12 years old, go to your mother and say, you know, I've got homework tonight, but the guys are having a little football game. Uh, Mom, can I go play the football game? Then do, honey, you get in there. You go play the football game after you've done your homework. You went to the old man. Oh, yeah, man, go play the game. Your homework will be here when you get back. I am telling you, we all had our parents figured out by the time we were 12. If I could understand God, you know what I would know? There's no God. There is no God. He exists only between my ears. But you know what I do? I read this book. And I get two things. Listen, when you read a book, if you are a reader, how many of you like to read? I like to read. How many of you like to read? Okay, you did not raise your hands. Have you seen our coloring book? <laughs> anyway, well, there's something for everybody. But um, when you read a book, you learn something from the book. But you also learn something about the author. Uh, I came into a church one time. This guy came up to me. Uh, I'd never met him. And he said, I read your answer book three times. Now, I don't know why I read it three times. I assume he was being punished. But um, <laughs> he said, I read your answer book three times. But he said, what he said next, I understood. He said, from reading it three times, I feel like I already know you. See, he wasn't just reading the book. He was reading the author. You know what I do when I read this book? I read this book. I read 30 pages every morning. And I'll say, uh, hey, God. This is some book. Yeah. It's just some book. But some days I don't say that. Some days I say, you are some God. Yeah. You know what those two things represent? One day I'm getting something from the book. I'm, I'm reading the book. The other day I'm reading, I'm reading the author. Yeah. Guys, there's just some stuff you ought to know about your Bible. You say like what? Well, look at Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 1, it says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles... Uh, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you word. Hey guys, I am sorry. You can believe anything you want, but not all of this Bible is for everybody. Right. Um, the Philippian jailer went up to Jesus Christ in Acts chapter 16 said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? What did they say to him? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved in thy house. Right? In Matthew chapter 19, a man went up to Jesus Christ and said, what do I do to get eternal life? And Jesus Christ said, uh, keep the commandments. Yeah. Let me ask you a question. If anybody ever said to you, what do I do to get eternal life? Are you going to say, keep the commandments? That's not for us. That can't be for us. Okay. Well, I just don't understand it. Well, read it till you do, bucko. Just because, you know, you get people that they don't understand. They, they read the Bible one time. Come on. What did you ever do that you like to do that you didn't do so good the first time? And you tried it 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 until you got good at it. But then you read the Bible one time. If you don't have the whole thing mastered, well, I'm just not going to read it. Keep reading it. Yeah. You need to learn something about dispensations. Look at verse 4. 
Whereby, when you read, you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ. Do you understand there's mysteries in this book? You're not going to understand a mystery. You know why? Because it's a mystery. It's not a whodunit. It's not somebody killed somebody and, and framed somebody else. But God has some mysteries in here. I know people like mysteries. And then you say the Bible's boring. You say there's nothing in the Bible you like. If you like mysteries, why aren't you reading the mystery book? Look what it says in verse 6. This is one of the mysteries. Uh, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. It is now revealed uh, unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. Look, here's the mystery. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partaker of his promise in Christ by the gospel. You know what we were in the Old Testament? Dogs, barbarians. But that's all we were. And the Jews rejected their Messiah. And you know what the Lord did? He opened the door to you and me. Be careful what you say. You know what I never say? I never say I'm glad Israel rejected Jesus Christ. But I say I'm thankful. I wish it would have been good. I think it would have, the best thing could have happened would be for all of Israel to say, yes, you are Messiah and we'll take it. We'll take you. But they did not. But because they did not, guys, you and I got in. Yes, sir. You should understand that. And so now, even though we call ourselves Gentiles, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 32, if you were born a Gentile and got saved, you're not a Gentile. If you were born a Jew and got saved, you're not a Jew. I love these, these Gentiles get saved and they go, well, you know, I've replaced Israel. I'm a Jew. Well, if you're a Jew, you're not saved. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says Jew, Gentile, and church of God. Now, that's not talking about the denomination church of God. That's talking about people who've trusted Christ, their personal Savior. And so Paul refers to himself, he said, I am a Jew by nature, but not anymore. You understand? Not spiritually. Not Now he's in the body of Christ. Now he's, a, he's part of the church of God. You ought to understand that. Oh, look at verse 7. Whereof I was made ministered according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effectual working of his power unto whom, uh, unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Oh, everybody likes to be rich. You know, I have to laugh. I have to laugh because people, you know, the news media says something, a bunch of stupid people say amen. They don't even mean it. I have to laugh how Americans badmouth the rich. Right? And the guy that's bad-mouthing the rich has a lottery ticket in his pocket hoping to become one. Right? Yeah. right? <laughs> Hell, I'm not like the rich, but I'm hoping to be. <laughs> I, look, look, if the rich are so bad, how come so many people are trying to become the rich? Because maybe the rich aren't so bad. Really, maybe they're not so bad. Maybe there's some bad rich people and maybe there's some bad poor people. I am not too sure, but most people that kill somebody robbing them aren't the rich. It's the ones that are trying to become them. But guys, you want riches? How about the unsearchable riches of Christ? You know, if the pastor of this church or any other pastor here, if you did this in your church, if uh, next Sunday the pastor gets up and says, now I want everybody to tell us how you got saved, your testimony, how you got saved, that'd be a precious service, would it not? And the next Sunday comes and he says, now this Sunday, what I'd like you to do is uh, I want everybody to tell us how you got saved. Well, okay. So, you know, you hear that again. That's good. That's good. And the next week he says, now, um, I want you to tell us how you got saved. Don't you think after about six weeks of that, you'd say, get the tape. <laughs> I would just get up and say, ditto. Didn't you, weren't you here last week? Look, it's great to be saved. But if you ask somebody how to get, how they got saved, they only have one answer. They only have one story, right? But what if he said this? This Sunday asked how he got saved. Next Sunday says, now here's what I want you to do. Tell us what God did for you in the last seven days. And then the next Sunday says, now tell us what God did for you in the last seven days. And the very person that last week told you what he did would tell you what he did this week. And the next week. You say, when does that end? Done end. It's unsearchable. Yeah. Guys, it, you know, I say it this way now. Let me explain this. Sometimes, sometimes, you know, some of us, we get up, you know, I was a drunk before I got saved. I was a, a, a car thief. I was a Roman Catholic. I was a Democrat. And um, this, all those ungodly things. Uh, and, um, and guys get up and say that, you know, they'll say, well, I was a dope dealer and I was a biker and all this other stuff and hit man for the mafia. Uh, and then I got saved. And here's what's wrong. 
There are people in here, some of you are, you are up in your 30s or your 60s and 70s, and you were raised in a Christian home, and you never got out into that world, and you never got dirtied by it, you never got tainted by it. And you know what you say? Oh, I don't have a testimony. If you have never been in the sin of this world, you got the best testimony in this room. The best testimony is here. You know what it is? I never held a cigarette in my hands. I've never tasted the booze. I was never immoral before I got saved. I never. I was pure when I got married. Guys, that is the best testimony there is. Do you understand? It's just that some of us don't have it. And for those of us who don't have it, I say it this way. Some of us got found in a ditch. Remember where you were? Now tell me if this isn't true. If the Lord found you in a ditch and would have saved you and left you in the ditch where he found you, you'd still be better for that, for what happened, right? I don't know anybody did that too. I don't know anybody got saved and when they opened up their Bible, there was no 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It went from 16 to, 15, uh, to 18. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And guys, it has not stopped. It is unsearchable riches of Christ. Look at verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery uh, from which the beginning of the, of the world hath been hid in Christ who created all things, or in God, who, who, hath, who, who created all things by Jesus Christ. You need to understand creation. And I want you to know, I'm not talking about theistic evolution. I'm talking about creation. They had me witness to this guy years ago. He was a physicist. They always give me those kind of brainy guys. And so, um, and so we're talking. Uh, and, um, and I said, uh, tell me what you believe. Now, you know, some of you are, you are intimidated by scientists. Why would you be intimidated by somebody who doesn't believe the Bible because they believe there was a dust cloud that blew up? Yeah, I mean, don't you think it could be, the answer could at least be something that sounded smart? And this is where he started. Well, you know, I think there was a big cloud of dust and it, uh, it blew up. But it actually kind of blew in because um, when the dust cleared, there was the earth. Guys, let me tell you something. I am not an explosives expert. I mean, other than maybe setting off some M80s and things when I was a kid, I really am not big on, I'm just not an explosive expert. But, but if evolution is true, we could take this pulpit out into the field back here, put a stick of dynamite in it, blow it up, and when the dust cleared, we had a three-bedroom house. <laughs> Now, you see, you laugh. But is it the same thing? Yeah. That, that this amoeba? By the way, everybody says John was the first Baptist. I am here to tell you, he was not. The amoeba was the first Baptist. Oh, yes, yes, very Baptistic. Only gets so big and then splits. <laughs> if I ever pass to another church, I'm going to name it Amoeba Baptist Church. <laughs> oh, look, we're big enough. Some of you leave. <clears throat> and so this guy's telling me all this stupid stuff he believes, a cloud of dust and a high ho silver. And, uh, and then, you know, this uh, amoeba crawled out of a mud puddle and he was a frog. And then he climbed up in a tree and he got a tail and his tail fell off and he became a college professor. Now, what, you should ask your evolution believing friends what they believe. And when they're telling you, do this, snicker and, 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 and chuckle. You say, oh, that's disrespectful. Yeah. Well, so why would you do that? Well, if you don't do that, they might think that what they're saying makes sense. But he knew what I wanted. See, I asked him what he believed. You know why I asked him. Because he's going, okay, preacher, what do you believe? But before I could say anything, he says, you don't really believe. It's just, and has you ever noticed all that tolerant crowd? They don't have any tolerance with creation. I've never had anybody say, well, you know, I believe in evolution. You believe in creation, but hey, let's go get a cup of coffee. It's always, I believe in evolution and you believe in creation. And that's what he said. He said, he says, you really, the venom was dripping. You really believe that God just spoke the universe into existence in seven 24 hour days. Forgive me, guys. Forgive me, I'm sorry. I, I just realized if I dared say yes, he'd think I was the stupidest person on the planet. I said, no. Six. <laughs> if God created anything on the seventh day, it was iced tea 
Because he just sat back and sipped on it and enjoyed what he'd done for the last six days. <laughs> Guys, I believe it. You say six 24 days? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, you think things were growing before there was sunlight, if God wants them to grow? Can you explain to me how something grows up through an asphalt parking lot with no sunlight? Well, it's not. Oh, no, give me that excuse. There's no way it does it, but it does it. And anyways, if it grew on the, four, uh, the day before the sun, sun came the next day. So it's okay. It made it. Yeah. But you need to understand creation. You ought to read about creation. I don't just mean in your Bible. I'm talking about you ought to read some of this stuff. You know, I tell those guys, I ask them this. I don't ask them any big serious thing, you know, like how many planets there are. And do you think there's something out there? I ask them this. Explain the evolution of the eyeball. What evolved first? The retina? The rods? The cones? Or was it the eyeball itself? Was it the lens? Was it the optic nerve? And if that all, that all evolved, how'd the fluid get in there? And where was the fluid until the eyeball was sealed? And if, they, if that happened, how do you explain that it happened twice? And how do you explain that it happened right here? That's how I know evolution isn't true. Because if evolution was true, come on, you parents, we don't have at least one. Right? Yeah. Come on, man. Doesn't evolution, you know, it, is there's no God, but evolution seems to give you what you need? Well, <laughs> right there. But aren't you glad that, that your eyes evolved right here? What if they'd evolved here? <laughs> I'm just having a look around. Glasses would be something, wouldn't they? Now, wait a minute. See, you're laughing, but that's because you're seeing how stupid evolution is. Yeah. These two eyes, if, if evolution is true, these two eyes evolved over millions of years, side by side, independent of each other. And while the, hey, by the way, do you know what else? You know that the optic, uh, the, the muscles in your eye, you got three on one side and three on the other. They are different than any muscle in the body. You know why? If I want to pick up this glass, the, hand, the muscles in my hands are relaxed. I wrap my hand around this glass and I tighten up the muscles. That's how you do it. You want to open a door. You tighten up the muscles in your hand. You pull, you tighten up the muscles in your arm. That's not how your eye works. The muscles in the eye on each side, three on each side, are always pulling. They are always in tension. You don't look to the right because the muscles on the right side of your eye started pulling your eye to the right. No, no, no. Your, your muscles on your right side of your eye are pulling, but they're in a tug of war with the muscles on your left. When you look to the right, the muscles on the left side of your eye just relaxed. Did you ever try to get something and you're trying to set it right on spot? You know what you do? You push in one way, you get somebody on the other side and push against you. And then you say, okay, now ease off a little bit, ease off a little bit. Having somebody push both directions, that's how you set it just perfectly. Guys, how on earth did a muscle evolve, six of them evolve in tension? That is like buying a tent, throwing it in the air. When it comes down, it's open and the ropes are tight. And that's funny again. And then what good are these eyes and the muscles if the, if the optic nerve did not decide to evolve at the same time? And if it did, you still got a loose end because the brain had to show up. And for some of those guys, that's where they lost out. <laughs> you need to understand that. Look at verse 10. To the intent that now under the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God. Guys, you need to know something about heaven. Yeah. You're going there. You've heard the song, the world, this world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue and the angels beckon me from heaven's open door and I don't feel at home, can't feel at home in this world anymore. You're going to heaven someday. We're going to leave this behind, okay? Uh, look, I don't know why the Lord hasn't come when we told him to. How many times? You know, 88 good reasons back in 88. And then somebody said in 89. And then I pulled into a Walmart. No, Kmart. It's Kmart, 1993. Uh, it was in May, and there was a great big Chevy Suburban had signs all over it, and there was a big sign that said, Jesus Christ is coming uh, on, on October 28th, 1993. This was in May. October 23rd came, went. I had a revelation. God didn't shop Kmart. <laughs> How many times has, has the return of the Lord been, been dated? Yeah. 
You know, guys, if you can, if you can date the rapture and that date comes and goes and the Lord doesn't show up, you know what that proves? You can find something in the Bible even God can't. Now, that's when you know some Bible. <laughs> hey, guys, but you need to understand heaven. You know what you need to understand? Don't get too comfortable here. I'm going to tell you something. We've been on the road for 20, uh, 33 years, this time in evangelism. I've been preaching for 48, but just in this 33 years, you know what I've seen? You know, I, I, every now and then I have somebody say, what was Christianity like in the 70s? And I said, in the 70s, the lost world thought they were here to enjoy life. And Christians thought they were here to serve God. Yeah. And even if they weren't, they knew they weren't right with God and ought to get right with God. But today... The lost world thinks it's still, they still think they're here to enjoy life. And the Christians think they're here to enjoy life. And they think they got a leg up on the lost world because they're not going to do it through drugs and booze and sex and everything else. See, everybody in the country wants to be at a party. And these guys want to go to some dope party, some pornographic party, some vile party. And you don't want to go there. You want to go to a tailgate. Well, we're going to just grill hamburgers and eat, drink Diet Coke. We're not going to do anything sinful. And we're going to talk about the Bible. But everybody wants to be at a party. And then the pastor comes by the party and says, hey, guys, we got to knock on some doors. We go, pastor, you're messing up our party. Yeah. We're, not, we're not doing anything bad here. Everybody wants to enjoy life. Guys, you're not here to enjoy life. Right. I hope you enjoy life, but you're not here to enjoy life. You're here to live for him, to his glory, till you get to heaven. That's when you're going to start enjoying things. Amen. You need to understand that. Look what it says, verse 11. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. Guys, you need to understand your eternal purpose. God put you here. I mentioned it the other day, that uh, uh, for, uh, um, purpose for existing book. Um, God created all things and uh, they were all created for him for his pleasure. Yes. We were put here to put a smile on the face of God. And instead, we get up every morning and tell him what he can do to put, put a smile on our face. That is so backwards. Maybe you can't stand, maybe you can't get Ephesians chapter 6 right because you've never gotten your marriage right in Ephesians chapter 5. But maybe you can't get Ephesians chapter 5 right because you never got your relationship with God right in chapter 4. Maybe you can't get your relation with, relationship with God right because you don't know the book he wrote. Right. But maybe you don't know the book he wrote because you don't know your new relationship to God. I didn't say, I didn't say with God, I said to God. We have a new relationship to God. And there is no greater chapter than Ephesians chapter 2. Look at verse 11. You will never find a passage in the Bible. You may find a verse, but you'll never find a passage that better describes what you were and what you are. What you were before you got saved and what you are since you got saved. Look what it says in verse 11. Wherefore remember ye that in time past, uh, being in time past, uh, time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. That at that time, ye were without Christ. Hey, anybody remember being without Christ? Yes, sir. Well, I remember being without Christ. There wasn't anything good about it. You know, some of you did the same thing I did when you were lost. We call it the good life. It wasn't good and it wasn't life. And I remember being without Christ. And it is a hopeless situation, guys. Without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Remember, he said the mystery that now the Gentiles are in, but they weren't in. They called us aliens. They called us strangers. Having no hope. Remember being without hope? Oh man, many a lost man, when he got to the part where there's no hope, put a gun to his head and blew himself into hell. Threw a rope around his neck, threw it over a, a, a rafter in the garage and jumped off a chair and woke up in hell. You say, why? No hope. You should never say you're without hope. Right. And without God in the world. I remember being without Christ. I remember being without God. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For here's our peace who have made both one and have broken down the middle wall of partition between us. You know how repulsive we were. We were so repulsive to God, he put a wall up to keep us separated from his chosen people, Israel. That's why we were separated from the covenants and the promises. We couldn't, we couldn't claim the promises of the Old Testament because we weren't Jews. 
Did you ever have a, you ever put up a fence because you can't take the neighbor's partying? Party That's what God did. He put up a wall of partition. And then he'd come and he'd meet with his people. And on the other side of the wall, he heard the howling of the dogs. He heard the, the braying of the barbarians. He heard the partying of your distant relatives and mine. Don't you get this mistaken, guys. Don't you think that black people all came from tribes and Indians all came from tribes. Can I tell you white folks something? Go back to Europe and go far enough back in your line and your kin came from tribes too. We were all a bunch of tribes. We were all a bunch of heathen. And we worshiped tree trunks and rocks and bashed each other's brains out while the crops were growing. And so God put a wall up so we wouldn't infest his people. And he said, look how he felt. Look how he felt. 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. He felt enmity toward us. You ever feel enmity towards somebody? Oh, not me. That's because you're a femme. There's somebody you, yeah, come on, isn't there anybody you ever looked at and you went, oh man, well, I used to want to feel self-righteous. Oh, you can hear. I'm going to tell you something, people. If you're ever sitting in a restaurant and two guys come walking in, skipping, holding hands and making eyes at each other, if you don't feel enmity right about that time, I ain't having lunch with you. They're just some people you see, you ought to have enmity. You say, well, you think you're better than them? Yeah. I am. You show, well, that's, that's proud. Oh, no, it's not. I don't molest children. I, you know, I'm, I, I, was, uh, I always get this, you know, the brother Jim, they give me the microphone. Guys, give, the sound men, they give me the mic. Or the pastor will give me the mic. And he'll say, uh, I'll, I'll go, what do I have to do? He said, you don't have to do anything. He'll turn you on when you get up there. I said, I ain't found a man to do that yet. <laughs> I was riding with a pastor. He's had a lot of heart problems. He's a good friend. He was one of my students about oh, 40 years ago. And he's had heart problems and we're driving. And he goes, he goes, you know, brother, he says, I, I got a tightness in my chest. I said, you think you're having a heart attack? He said, I don't know. I said, well, I just want to let you know. I said, if you need mouth to mouth, you are a dead man. <laughs> I said, you see these lips? I said, these lips will never touch them lips. I said, if you feel yourself slipping away, tell me what you want me to tell your widow, bucko, because that's all you're getting out of me. I told my college class that I teach, I said, you guys, I said, if I fall down here, clutch my chest and start gasping for air, don't you dare come put your lips on my lips. You think I want to tell somebody I'm alive because one of my students kissed me? I said, hey, girls, give it a try. But anyway, I feel it coming on right now. But hey, guys, guys, there was enmity. We were aliens. We were strangers. We were barbarians. We were dogs. So he put up a wall. Right. Having abolished the enmity which the law, uh, uh, even the law of, of commandments contained in ordinances uh, for to make him in himself of twain one new man so making peace that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you which were afar off. Remember being afar off? I remember being far off. I remember being far from God, brother. There wasn't anything good about it. There wasn't all this stuff about it. I remember the good old days. There were no good old days. You know, I had some guy tell me one time, he goes, oh, you Christians, you don't have any fun. I said, we have fun. I said, we just don't count our good times by how much we threw up last night. I mean, you, you're having a good time if you haven't woke up in your own vomit, right? Yeah. Came and preached peace to you which were far off and to them which were nigh that through him we both have access by one spirit under the Father. Let me, let me tell you what happened. I was preaching a number of years ago in the Baltimore area. And the pastor picked me up at the airport. And he says this. He's taking me to the, to the motel. He says, preacher, I'm sorry. He said, I didn't know this. But he said, they're remodeling this motel. And he said, I'm sorry if there's noise or anything. You know, there's going to be some hammering and things like that. And so there's the sign. And we turn in. And there's no building. There's no building. Where the building was is a pile of rubble. It's just a long column of rubble that, that kind of pyramids about 12 feet high. No, no, no. You think they tore down building A and I'm staying in building B. No, they tore down building A. There was no building B. And there was no building A. And we pulled in and I just saw this pile of rubble. And I said, which pile's mine? You don't ask these guys to change the wallpaper. Look what you get. 
Well, he found out. He found out he had the right franchise. He had the right motel. He just had the wrong location. So he took me over there. But I never forgot it. I never forgot that pile of rubble. You know why? Because you and I were on the other side of the wall. Yep. And we were foreigners and we were aliens and we were strangers and we were dogs and we were barbarians. And on this side of the wall, God had just gathered the Jews to him and say, let me tell you promises. Let me tell you what I'm going to do for you. Let me tell you what I'm going to do for Israel and Jerusalem. And then they rejected him. And he sent his only begotten son down and they killed him. And you know what he did? He came out of that, that grave three days, three nights later, and he walked out of that grave and he walked up one side. All I see is where that wall was, now a big old pile of rubble. And the Lord Jesus Christ, in his resurrection body, walked up over top of that pile of rubble, walked back down the other side, grabbed you and me by the hand, and he said, come with me, I want you to meet my dad. Yeah. And he took us by the hand, and up that side of the pile of rubble, we went and back down. Do you ever, did you ever do anything? You ever been someplace where somebody had a start? Let me tell you what happened. Uh, you folks are visiting. You didn't know this, but I was telling these folks, my folks were Romanian. And... Um, uh, and they they got saved, but they my dad had a stroke, and so and my mom was a follower. She never drove, she never did anything. She she followed her husband, and we had that stroke. Had he not had that stroke, I think he'd have got into the Baptist church uh, and got active for God, and then my mom would have. But he didn't uh, because he, he had, two months after he got saved, he had this stroke, and he never never got into a good church. And my mom never did, and so they had they had this. Uh, that church where my dad's funeral was, it was a Romanian Catholic church. By the time my mom died some years later, it was a cathedral. It had been stepped up one. It was a Romanian Catholic cathedral. And they, they had a bishop that ran that thing. Now, I understand what they call him. Because he's a Roman Catholic. But I told the, I told the, uh, I told the uh, funeral director, I said, tell the guy that runs the place. I'm not going to say the bishop. I said, tell that guy that runs a place that her son is a Baptist preacher and that I'm going to say something during the funeral. So it's one of the funniest lines I've ever heard. I'm sitting right here in the second row. And, and the guy dressed in black, you know, dressed like mother, called himself father, got the black gown on, got the black hat on, probably carrying. Anyway, I'm sitting here and this priest comes out and he says this to me, like I'm sitting right where you are, brother. And he leans over and he says, the bishop says you may speak as long as you don't say anything contrary to Catholic doctrine. Have you, ever been, have you ever been threatened by somebody saying, I'm going to kill you by throwing these marshmallows at you? <laughs> I mean, if I, say, if I don't say anything, if I say something contrary to Catholic doctrine, what are they going to do? Not have me in for a meeting? <laughs> Throw me out of my mother's funeral? I mean, really, if there was ever a gun that was unloaded, that was the one. I have a <laughs> oh. <laughs> so they give me the nod and I stood up and this bishop thought I was going to speak from there. But I walked up here. When I walked up here, this guy is sitting here. And when, when I walked up, he started to stand up. He was going to stop me. He just couldn't believe I stepped up on this holy ground of this cathedral with a King James Bible. And brother, I mean, I spent about 15 minutes preaching the gospel, 15 minutes for the King James Bible. And then we got out of there and we went to the funeral, uh, to, the, to the graveside. And I, I gave my wife the elbow. I said, babe, you know what they're doing back in that church? I said, they're still running around that, that pulpit with slinging smoke and water, trying to purify it. <laughs> but you see, when I stepped up there, that guy almost, he almost stood up to stop me. Jesus Christ grabbed, that, grabbed you by that nail-scarred hand and he let us up the rubble of that where well, that partition was broken down and down the other side. We stepped in the presence of his father and his father saw him. Oh, yes. And, and, he, and, and his, well, he had a start. Jesus Christ raised a nail-scarred hand. Say, it's okay, Dad. I want you to meet my friend. And we were reconciled. Let me ask you a question. Gentiles, lost, even saved. If the temple were, were in Jerusalem right now, could we go in it? No, sir. No, sir. We would not be welcome in that, right? And was, you know, you know, we refer to this building as the house of God. And I don't mind if you do. You just know that this isn't the house of God. You know that when I get done preaching tonight at 1130 and we lock this place up, we're not locking God in here. Okay, so this isn't, the, but the temple was the house of God. Back behind that holiest of all, that holy of holies, God lived, did he not? And we had no business going into his house. But now look at verse 19. Now therefore you're no more strangers and foreigners. 
but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Guys, can I tell you why you're going to heaven? Because you belong there. You belong there. This is my country. I've told you I travel around this world and I've traveled in third world countries. I've traveled where the communists said they're going to kill me before the week was out. And I've traveled where they got electricity and you can drink the water and everything is just fine other than driving the wrong side of the road. But I'm not a citizen there and I never feel right till I get off the plane in this country. This is where I belong. You understand? But you know this world? We don't belong here. We're going to heaven because that's where we belong. You know what's wrong with some of you? You're trying to feel comfortable in a country that's not really right. yours. Yes. You can't figure out why you can't get comfortable. You're never going to get comfortable because yes, you don't belong here because your citizenship is up there. Amen. Now look what it says. Verse 20. Three of the most amazing verses. And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Before we got saved, we weren't allowed in the temple. We weren't allowed in the house of God, right? Now I am the house of God. What know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God and you're not your own. If you're bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit which are God's. This is the temple. This is the house. This building is not the house. I'm the house. You're the house. You know who's the house of God? The person that wasn't even allowed in it one day. You know who is the house of God? Somebody who is a stranger and a foreigner and a barbarian and a dog and an alien. But that enmity is gone now. And that partition is gone now. And you know, guys, you know what you need? You have to understand that we have a new relationship to God. And until you know you got a new relationship to God in chapter two, you're never going to stand the Bible in chapter three. And until you understand the Bible, you're never going to understand your relationship with God or for God in chapter four. And until you get that stuff straightened out with God, guys, how are you going to get along with a human? Chapter five, your marriage. And if your marriage isn't right, you're never going to be able to take a stand. But look at chapter one. In chapter 1, it says this very, very simply. Verse 6. For the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. You know where this book starts? Salvation. Because, guys, isn't that where you start? You ever meet somebody? I, had a, when I, I was on the staff of a church about 2,000 people some years ago. And uh, this lady called the church and she said, have a preacher come and talk to my husband. He needs to get baptized. So they sent me. And I went there and I still remember this guy's name. His name was Ron. And, and here's what the problem was. Ron was being bad. And you know what women want? They want their husband to get enough religion to straighten up, but not so much they want to go, go to church and start tithing. Yes, sir. And so she thought, he just needs to get baptized, you know, turn over a new leaf. And, and I got talking to him, and he wanted to get baptized. I mean, dunked in a Baptist church. And he wasn't saved. And she wasn't saved. And I said, ma'am, I said, I'll baptize him, and I can baptize you. And I said, it's not going to do either. It's going to do either one of you any good. You need to get saved. I explained salvation to them. They got down on their knees at their couch. They both trust, trusted Jesus Christ. They got baptized, got into church. But guys, you got people that, that are trying to turn over a new leaf. They're, they're trying some new successful way of living. They're trying to have a better attitude. And you'll just go to hell with a good attitude. Yeah. You'll go to hell with a religion. Yeah. Look, you can go to hell with any, any name. You understand tonight that there's a place in hell for Methodists? Yeah. There's a place in hell for Mormons? There's a place in hell for Roman Catholics. There's a place in hell for Muslims. There's a place in hell for Episcopalians. You understand there's a place in hell for Baptists. Now, it's, it's probably over here all by itself because even there they won't fellowship with anybody else. I mean, they, Baptists may go to hell, but they'll still keep their convictions. <laughs> Guys, you know what you need? You need to get saved. How many people said, well, I just need to quit drinking. No, you need to get saved. Well, I need to change the way I live. No, you need to get saved. I need to turn over a new leaf. Nope, you need to get saved because when you get saved, you are a new creature. It's all taken care of. Yes. You know why some people can't take that stand in chapter six? 
because they never got their marriage right in chapter 5. And they can't get their marriage right in chapter 5 because they can't get their, their relationship to God right, with God right in chapter 4. They can't get that right because they don't know that Bible in chapter 3. And they can't get that Bible because they don't understand the relationship to God, how it changed in chapter 2. And how did it change? Redemption through his blood. Aren't you glad for redemption? Yes. You know what? I, I like that word redemption. I think redemption is more than salvation. I really do. Here's what I mean. And I don't, I'm not making some new doctrine or anything like that. But I mean this. Uh, again, I, I think I was telling the pastor. Uh, it's nice to be saved. But I like when people get ruined. Right. Come on. You know what ruined is? Ruined is where you get saved and you go out and try to live like you always did. And all of a sudden you go, I don't belong here. I, I talked to this fellow in church many years ago, and he said, he said, I got saved. Somebody invited me to church, and I went on a Sunday night. I got saved Sunday night. And he said, you know what I did Monday night? He said, I did what I did every Monday night. I went to the bar. Just have, he wasn't going to get drunk, just have a few beers with the boys, because that's what he did every Monday night. But he said, and he said, look, you understand when this guy got saved, nobody gave him a sheet of paper. You're saved now. You don't drink. You don't smoke. You don't cuss. Uh, you don't smile. No more happiness. They didn't tell him anything but that he was going to heaven. And Monday night, he went to the bar. And he said, I'm sitting at the bar. And he said, sitting right next to me is this buddy of mine telling me filthy jokes like he, he did every Monday. He did this every Monday. But he said, he said that this night I'm going, I, I, I don't want to hear these. And he said, a couple of stools down are two guys who are always there every, every Monday night. And he said, they're just taking God's name in vain and using the name of Jesus Christ in an unclean way like they always did. But he said, I'm thinking, I, I don't want to hear that. And he said, I picked up my beer and he, said, he looked at it and I went, I, I, this, this doesn't belong in my hand anymore. He said, what happened? He got saved? No, he got ruined. He got ruined. He tried to go back that life and couldn't. Boy, I'd worry a little bit if I got saved and I fit back into that world. Yes. You know what redeemed is? Let me tell you what nobody in this room ever did. You never went and bought a Coke can. Well, maybe the pastor's wife did. <laughs> you bought a Coke that came in a can. And when you got what you wanted, which was the Coke, which was inside, you got rid of the can. Now, maybe you're, maybe you're like a typical American. You threw alongside a road. And then somebody came along with a plastic bag. And they, they picked up that can that you saw no value in. And they said, I see a value here. I get 10 cents. I'm going to what? Redeem it. Yes. Where you saw no value, somebody saw a value. Well, I don't know what you were like when I was lost. When you were lost, I was really lost. Yes. I was really lost. You know, I, I spent my first night in jail when I was 14 years old, stole my first car when I was 14, got arrested my first time when I was 14. And when I got, when I got in that jail that night, you know what I did? I took the pencil out of my pocket. He said, oh, they didn't let you keep a pencil. Man, 1964, they'd let you keep a gun. <laughs> they didn't even search you. The, the cop cars had door handles on the inside of the back door. And you just pull the button up and get out. I mean, that's how it was. They just put you in jail. They didn't, they didn't have you empty your pockets. And so the walls were white in that jail. And I just walked over the wall, took my pencil in my pocket, and wrote, Sam Gipp. You say, why? Because that wall looked, you know what it looked like? It looked like a yearbook. Everybody that went to jail signed the wall. I said, put my name there. I said, oh, yeah. there's my friend Tom. And there's Billy. And there's Tom. There's Mike, and there's Tom. Anyway, um, you know, uh, they tore that jail down. I have not been in the new one. I've not been in the new one. When uh, I was back at the Massillon Baptist Temple, some years after I was off the staff, an 18-year-old boy came up to me, and he said, guess what happened in school today? Now, it worries me when a boy's excited about school. And I said, what? And this kid was taking auto body training, fixing wreck cars and painting them in the very same shop that I took it back in 1967 and 68. And he, and, and he said, uh, he said, I take, he said, I take uh, auto body training down at Washington high school. I said, yeah, that's where I took it. He said, you know what happened today? It was on Wednesday. I said, what? He said, well, the, the tool crib was upstairs. And he said, I'm in charge of the tool crib and we're moving the tool crib from upstairs to downstairs. I took everything off the shelves 
and unbolted these shelves. And when I pulled them away from the wall, there on the wall, in great big letters and black magic marker, Sam Gipp with, with a 1968 date. I went, yeah, I remember that. I said, I was in charge of Tool Crib when we moved it from downstairs to upstairs. I mean, is this not government work? <laughs> move it upstairs, move it downstairs, move it upstairs, move it downstairs. And I said, I remember, I said, before I bolted those shelves to the wall, I signed that wall. I thought, I'll be gone before they find out. And you know something, that school not understanding the importance of that name, painted over it. So as I speak to you tonight, you can go to the Masson City Jail. My name is not on the wall. You go to Washington High School to the auto body training. My name is not on that wall. But I still got my name on the wall of one public building in my hometown. You know what it is? The library. My books are on the shelf. <laughs> Man. Which is a real shock for some of my English teachers. <laughs> Every now and then librarian hears a, 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 a teacher going, it can't be. <laughs> and down they go. And they all die with my fight on book in their hand. <laughs> but let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. The guy, that, the guy that signed that jail wall and signed that school wall could never get a book on the public shelf, library shelf. So what would it take? Took Jesus Christ. Now look here. You know what you need to do? Chapter one, you need to get saved. Then chapter two, you need to understand your new relationship to God. Then chapter three, spend the rest of your life learning this book. Then understand your new relationship, chapter four, with God. Then get your relationship with your wife or your husband right. Then maybe you can stand in chapter six, but oh, wait a second. Go back to chapter six. Look what he says there in verse 11, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He says there in verse 13, wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand an evil day, having done all to stand, stand therefore. But that's not what it's about, guys. That's not what it's about. Look at verse 20. For which I am an ambassador. You know what they say? The best ambassadors are former military men. Because they always got the best interest of their country in mind. Yes. See, you get saved. You understand your new relationship to God. You get to learn that book. You understand your new relationship with God. You get your, your relationship, your marital relationship in order. Then you take a stand. And after you take a stand for a while, maybe God will appoint you an ambassador. What a place to end. But you know what you want to do? You want to be an ambassador. And you aren't even doing number chapter 2 or chapter 3 or chapter 4 or chapter 5. You understand? You got this whole thing backwards. Start with one. You say, well, I am saved. Okay. Then you're done with chapter 1. How are you doing chapter two? What are you doing pouring beer into the house of God? What are you doing letting the house of God see some things that you're letting it see? What are you doing talking like a lost man? I mean, I get people, they go on my website and they, they talk like I did before I got saved while they cuss me, telling me I'm not saved. Guys, why are you not changed from what you were? Why do you not know the Bible? Let me tell you people something. I'll tell all you church members, even if you're church members from, from one of these other pastors, you get this straight. It is not just your pastor's duty to know the Bible. Right. Amen. He should know it for two reasons. One, because he's a Christian and he should know it. It's his obligation too. But he should know it because he's got to teach you. But you need to be a student of that book right. until you die. You need to learn something about this book. And you're going to learn that book. And you know what you're going to come across? You're going to come across something you don't like to find out. And that'll be the test. And you know what happens to many Christians? They learn something. And they go, oh, man, I'm learning something. This is good. And they take a step. They go, oh, man, oh, look at that. Whoa, whoa this is wonderful. And then all of a sudden, they learn something. They go, well, well if, I, if I do this, I can't keep living like I was. I'm just not, I'm not doing that. I want to be a Christian. I'm not going to be a fanatic. Your spiritual growth stops right there. And some of you, you know why you aren't growing any spiritual, spiritually? Because you grew, you grew, you grew, and then you saw someplace God was taking you, and you said, well, I ain't going that far. And sure enough, you haven't. But if you're going to stop at chapter three, don't expect to get to chapter four or five and six. You chose to stop. 
You need to be saved, chapter 1. You need to understand your new relationship to God, chapter 2. You need to get this book, read this book, study this book, learn this book, teach this book, chapter 3. You need to understand your new relationship with God, chapter 4. You need to make your marriage right. You know what some of you husbands ought to do? You ought to tell your wife, you, the, the sister right here, Megan? Megan asked me last night, she said, give me some, some give us some new married couples advice. I said, don't ever call each other names. 46 years, my wife and I never called each other names. I call her nice things, but I don't call her ugly things. You get mad at your husband, you get mad at your wife, you call them names. They'll never forget that. Oh, but I asked them to forgive me, but they never forget that it must have been in your heart because it came out your mouth. I told them, I said, I said 46 years ago, I thought that was a good idea. Now I realize the stroke of genius. Look at her and look at me. We get a name calling contest, name calling. I said, that's, that's like getting a rock fight. She gets all the rocks. <laughs> when you get a face like this, you don't call people names. <laughs> and maybe you stop growing. You're going to have to understand your relationship with God. Some of you, you know what you need to do? You need, men need to look at your wife and say, I will love you. I will love you. I will be true to you. Some of you ladies, I will submit. I will not always agree, but I will agree to submit. If you don't get that right, how are you going to stand against the devil? And if you don't stand against the devil, why would God ever use you as an ambassador? I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I was going to ask you a question. Then I'm going to have a word of prayer. Then the piano will begin to play. And you are invited to do business with God. But let me just ask you this question. I'm just asking, really. How many, by an uplifted hand, would say this? Preacher, as you spoke tonight, I saw which chapter that I need to work on in my life. I, I think, I, I, I've been wondering about some things, and now I see. I see the chapter I need to get, get squared away on. Here's my hand to acknowledge that. Just lift them up. Okay, you put them down. Now understand. See, here, here's what I can't understand about Christians. They say, I want to go to church. I want God to speak to me. And then when he speaks, they don't like what he said. But do you understand that if, if you raised your hand, that means he spoke to you and you heard him. But if you don't act on what you heard, why do you expect to hear from him again? I told you, God doesn't do anything in vain. If he speaks to you and you don't act, why would he tell you anything else? So maybe tonight you need to say, okay, God, okay. Now, if you're not saved, man, you need to get saved. But I'll guarantee you most of the people in this room are saved. But some of you need to understand your new relationship to God. You, are, you weren't allowed. You were a stranger, a foreigner, an alien. Now you are the temple of God. Clean up that temple. Maybe you understand that that book is not just something you carry to church to show people that you're a Christian. Maybe you need to understand what's inside of it. Maybe you need to understand your relationship with God. Maybe you need to take your husband and your wife Say, I'm so sorry for what I've said to you. I'm so sorry I never take you out. I'm so sorry I never tell you I love you. I'm so sorry I used to be kind to you when we were dating, but as soon as we got married, I quit. I'm so sorry that, that I, I was very humble when we got married, but now I won't submit to anything you say. Maybe you need to take care of chapter four tonight. Maybe you need to take, take or chapter five tonight. You get them five down, take a stand. And then God may have appoint you an ambassador. Father, thank you for your goodness and your grace. Thank you for this book. And thank you, God, that it does tell us how to be saved, but it tells us so much more. So much more. God, these are pieces of dirt, pieces of clay, me, they. That's all we are. But that you would use a piece of dirt to glorify you. Just amazing, God. It is amazing. And there's no way dirt can glorify you unless you get an, give us an instruction book to tell us how. And God, we carry that book proudly. We thank you for that book all the time. But God, what good is thanking you for it if we're not going to be in it, if we're not going to read it, if we're not going to learn it, if we're not going to let it change our lives? I pray for the people that raised their hands tonight, God. They heard from you. They didn't hear from me. They heard from you. And if they heard from you, then I hope they respond to you and that they answer you tonight. And they get the chapter squared away in Ephesians. They need to. So they can proceed down, down the line.
to where they'll understand they'll be able to take a stand someday for you. And who knows, God, maybe you'd important them an ambassador. Wouldn't that be an honor? In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, the piano plays. If you need to come and talk to the Lord, why don't you come? Why don't you come? There's room for you. If you need to come, you step up, talk to the Lord. If God talked to you, it's time for you to talk to him.